Hello, everybody. Is the mic working? Yeah. Um, well, let me uh, welcome you also to um, the session, The Web Women Want, How Does Tech Fuel the Feminist Discourse? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Republika. Uh, Republika. I really like Republika. I've been here, this is my fourth time. Still, when I look at this room, when I'm at outside, um, I really feel we are a very homogenic crowd. And I'm part of this crowd, of course. We all kind of look the same. There are similar fashions that we follow. We listen to the same kind of music. We are mainly white. We are well off. This is us, right? The German urban hipster. Great. So, <laughs> um, our job, you might ask yourselves, uh, why, why are we actually the Ministry for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development? Why are we organizing such a, se such a session? And our job is to, bit, to, to broaden the perspective a bit and to point out that there are really large regions in the world where there is no internet, where there is no such a crowd like us, where, where everything is quite, quite different. So we are not diverse, but I really would want everybody to walk out of the session and think about maybe the feminist discourse in Ghana or the feminist discourse in India and how we can be more inclusive. But let me now uh, pass the words on to my very dear colleague, Daniel Braun, who will give you um, the welcoming words from the ministry. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Excellent. So you might wonder why is there a male guy standing up there? Daniel Brown from the BMZ, German Federal Ministry for Development Corporation. The answer is easy, because it's our duty too. This is not only a women topic, this is also a male topic. So let me start from our perspective with two statements on this topic. The first is, the digital transformation empowers women, full stop. The second statement is, the digital transformation disempowers women, full stop. So you might wonder, um, that's a contradiction, right? No, we see both happening right now. And let me a little bit elaborate on this. How is the digital transformation empowering women? Digital technologies can be powerful catalysts for gender equality and women empowerment. I have three examples um, from our work at BMZ. In Ecuador, for example, we created an app which helps women at risk to notify an emergency center or a person of trust. The clue is that this app is pre-installed on the cell phones, so you don't have to explain why you have an app like this on your cell phone. Second example, in Myanmar, we use a gaming app as a simple but effective tool to inform women textile workers about their labor rights. This app is really successful. Um, until the end of 2017, almost 5,000 workers have used this app and educated themselves about their own rights. In Tunisia, women farmers can take a picture of their plants, upload them to a database, and get, via picture recognition, a, success, a suggestion for treatment and for watering and for a better farming. So what's about the dark side? What's about the other side? Why is the digital transformation disempowering women at the same time? There's a gender digital divide. We have an urban uh, digital divide, we have an age digital divide, but there's a gender digital divide as well. Women are not benefiting equally from the potentials of the digital transformation. I think we can agree on that. And it's particularly true for the countries that we are working in as development people. Women and girls have less access to, di to digital technologies. Women and girls have less digital skills, unfortunately. That's why we're working on this. And they feel less confident to use them. 
Women are underrepresented in the tech sector, in Germany as well. And the internet is dominated by male discourse and narratives. We all know this as well. Fearing harassment, women hide between, uh, behind male avatars. Web feminists increasingly suffer from attacks and hate speech. It sometimes seems that the internet reverses the achievements of feminism and female empowerment of the past decades. At the same time, the web helps to bring out the voice of women all around the world, loud and clear. The digital revolution offers new channels to promote equal access to rights, education, and economic opportunity. Female tech entrepreneurs, like in our projects, researchers and activists from all around the world fight for overcoming the digital gender gap. We all together, men and women. They create innovative platforms which enable women to raise their voice. They use creative tools to fight stereotypes. And they engage in teaching girls and young women to learn how to code. We will publish a book later this year to make some of these role models who challenge existing gender stereotypes visible. But the web also brings out the support of male allies. The He for She campaign, for example, shows the support of our minister, Gerd Müller, and many other prominent and less prominent supporters for gender equality. So why are we here today? We have launched the eSkills for Girls campaign last year to raise awareness on the empowering, empowering and disempowering nature of digital technologies for women and girls. And we got a commitment from the heads of states and governments of the G20 to support equal opportunities for men and women online. This is a strong statement. Some of you might remember the poetry slam against the gender digital divide we had last year here at Republica. This year, we want to move a step forward and discuss how the digital tools help to make women voices heard and how do they contribute to fight unequal gender relations. That's the panel I'm looking forward to and I hope you too. Please welcome our panelist guests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so what we want to talk uh, in this session about is what are other perspectives on online feminism? We want to discuss digital technologies against um, the practical experiences of our panelists. And we want to see also what are potential backlashes. But let me now invite to the stage our very uh, estimated uh, um, panelists. That is Dorothy Gordon from Ghana, Japlene Pasricha from India, and Robert Franken from Germany. Um, before we, we um, start the panel discussion, I'd like to just quickly give a quick insight on how I perceive the uh, feminist online discourse. In Germany, we had um, um, some, some, I think, major, um, major uh, um, processes with uh, the hashtag MeToo, which you also, also know, and uh, the hashtag Aufschrei. And to my mind, that have, has really shaped the discourse. Um, and when we were preparing this, this panel together with, um, with the colleagues, we were wondering, or we were thinking, this had an impact here in Europe. Still, I believe it is a very exclusive and very wide discourse. And I was wondering, is there also something similar, for example, in India or in Ghana? And is there, or is this really something particularly that we find super uh, interesting, or don't we just simply don't know about it? Yeah, maybe. 
Thank you, Catherine. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jopleen from India, and I run a feminist platform called feminisminindia.com. It's an online media platform. Uh, coming to your question, Katwin, uh, as we know, Me Too was started uh, by Tarana Burke 10 years back, but none of us knew about it then, right? Like, how many of us knew about Me Too 10 years back? Okay, even I didn't know about it. So Me Too uh, went global for various reasons. A, it was started uh, in Hollywood, and it because it was uh, a movement that st was started by celebrity stars, against celebrity stars, it got a lot of media uh, coverage. Uh, it was a very important movement which had a global impact all over the world where similar movements then started in other parts of the country. As Catherine also mentioned, Aufschrei was one of them in Germany. But uh, I think, and in India also there was a lot of impact, but what I would like to say here is that we shouldn't uh, take Me Too as a template where, you know, all the movements started just last year because there have been a lot of movements in India and in other parts of the country uh, which have been talking about sexual violence, sexual harassment. Uh, and if I may show a slide that I wanted to, that I've put in the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah excellent. Yeah, we can, we can do this now. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it just ties in with... Yeah. So this is a picture from... And I'm on the right side. Uh, this is a picture from a movement, from a protest march that I and a couple of my colleagues uh, from all over India, we were about 30 organizations and individuals who organized a march called I Will Go Out. Uh, it was a march against sexual harassment for uh, to, to reclaim public, uh, safe public spaces for women. And it was a march that, we, that was organized on Jan 21st, 2017, which was at the same time of the Women's March in the US. Uh, a lot of people asked us, you know, is this a India chapter of the Women's March? And we were very clear and we wanted to emphasize that although Women's March in the US or in other parts of the world could be important for them, for us this march was different and important because it had local context. So I think what I'm trying to say here is uh, Me Too was a movement that was started in one part of the country, but it may or may not have local context in other parts of the world because not everybody would have that kind of access to, let's say, a New York Times article and a huge social media following where they can call out a person, uh, uh, you know, as big and important as Harvey Weinstein and have the same kind of impact. But there are many smaller movements which are not known to the bigger world because they are local and regional movements. Mm -hmm. One question here when it comes to the march. I was doing an internship uh, some 15 years ago uh, at Amnesty International Australia. And we were also um, organizing, uh, forming part of something which seems to be a bit similar. It's called Reclaim the Streets. And it was also some feminist movement where we wanted to go out on the streets and say, this is also our sphere, right? We are not afraid. Um, I found out later on that, in particularly that night, a lot of women got raped because they were outside in the streets and feeling really free and feeling safe, which were they indeed they weren't. So, talking about um, sexual harassment and also a discrimination against in uh, India, do you have experienced something similar when organizing this march? Uh, that's a very good point. When we were organizing this march, we had to uh, keep this in consideration that although we are uh, demanding safe streets for women, but that's not what we have right now. So what we are demanding is an ideal situation, but we don't have it. So we had to change the timings of the march. We earlier thought that we would keep it to a midnight march where we start at 10 and end maybe at 1 a.m. Uh, but that was not possible because we had a lot of young women, uh, especially students, uh, college students, and in India you have curfews in hostels at universities. Mm -hmm. So that's the irony that this march was uh, started at 5 p.m. in the evening instead of 10 p.m. in the night because mm -hmm. we didn't have, we couldn't assure safety of the women who were participating with us as organizers. And yeah, yeah I mean, uh, we, we were demanding for something, but it's also important to be realistic and say, uh, will we be safe if we go out at 10 p.m. instead of going at 5 p.m.? Yeah. 
Dorothy, let me just quickly introduce you to. Um, you've been an activist in uh, the feminist movement in West Africa. You lived in India and in uh, Ghana. And um, you've more than 20 years of experience. Um, and I'd like to know, is there a specific African characteristic to online feminism? Is it what, do you think there's something? I don't think so at all. Um, <clears throat> if you, even if you look at a single African country, um, you're going to find many different realities. Excuse me. <coughs> Yeah, no, it's fine. And um, I mean, basically, you, our societies are in transition. Um, these are artificial countries from many, encompassing many different ethnicities, and they are under immense pressure from both the formal uh, post-colonial systems, which are very patriarchal, and then, of course, we have that now accentuated by a very patriarchal online space uh, that has, um, is being dominated by a single culture. And so within a single country, you're going to find many different realities. You will find rural women who uh, may not be participating actively at all online, and so they wouldn't have heard of something like Me Too. And then you will have urban elite women who are perhaps educated abroad, and they would have that Me Too mentality and be excited to be part of that movement. And then you have all the rest in between. I think that um, what people are realizing now is that being online changes a little bit the, the way the game is played. Mm -hmm. And so people are realizing that we have to be far more active in creating content that comes with our own cultural perspective. I was surprised when we were doing the briefing for this that people did not know that in some parts of Africa we still have strong matrilineal societies like the one I come from. My children belong to my family. There's never been any question of being able to uh, register land in my name. Mm -hmm. I keep my own income. That's not to say that we don't have all the general problems of violence against women and all those other things, but it's different. And then what we see now is our children do not want to accept that they belong to our family because when they go to school, they have to register their father's Mm -hmm. uh, surname, which was not part of our culture. Mm -hmm. So you see that it's very, very complicated. I loved being in India because India also is very complex and varied mm -hmm. in terms of how um, d the gender issue is addressed between different parts and different religions, etc. So we have a lot of variation and we can't have a one size fits all kind of solution. We always will have to contextualize when it comes to um, the approaches we want to take to get a better kind of, uh, let's say, a feminist environment online, yeah. Still, I feel, I feel that the feminist movement and also the uh, online feminist movement is very fragmented. And I believe that uniting power would make us actually stronger. And the question would be, is the fragmentation actually in between cultures, in between countries, or is it a class issue? I think I would say all of the above. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't, it's all of those things, but all we need to do is to be able to find those common area, areas of common interest and then understand that um, the approaches that we are going to take to resolving those issues may not be uniform in each of our various environments. You know, so I think that these are kind of basics to social mobilization that we've learned over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a question of us getting behind this, deciding how we are going to use new technology to mm -hmm. achieve this. Mm -hmm. Robert, um what I always uh, hate uh, when we talk about uh, um, gender, um, gender equality, discrimination against women, is that very often at those kind of conferences we have an all-female panel. So, um, and this I think I think is really annoying because when we talk about an inclusive uh, uh, movement, we of course need to have men at our side. So let me just briefly introduce you. Um, 
Yesterday in our briefing, we were talking about the role of socialization and that men have to be part of, of this. And you have uh, a blog, actually. It's called... Um, you just tell me about the blog. Yeah. Uh, we have established a, a platform called Male Feminists Europe. Mm -hmm. I did that together with a male feminist from Denmark, Hendrik Marstal, who is uh, very famous for uh, standing in uh, for male feminism. And we were looking for a place to publish our content in English in order to address a European public and a European audience. And we couldn't find one. That's why we, we, we established it. And um, what we're trying to do there is kind of to bridge the gap between men and the concept of feminism because a lot of men still think that this is a female issue only just because of the name and uh, we are trying to fight the misunderstandings there and we are trying to provide a kind of a low-key entry point for men into the discussion. It's, it's hard work and it's small steps and it's very frustrating from time to time but on the other hand there are more and more men uh, who are open to um, to ideas like that and uh, for us it's also important to be visible uh, within this context and framing of the male ally somehow. They, they, they read about us and then they start thinking about, well, this is existing and either they fight us immediately or they ask what we are about and if they could do something and that's, that's a good entry point from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, maybe let's just now have a quick look at the tech side uh, of life and how digital tools especially can actually help to advocate for our political and economic and uh, social rights. And um, the past years, we've seen a lot of tools, uh, apps, platforms, and so on and so forth. And um, I'd like to um, invite you to tell us a bit about some practical uh, examples that you brought with you. And maybe, uh, Japlin, do you want to start? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will start with the same uh, picture behind me. Uh, as I said, this was a protest march that was organized in response to a mass molestation case that happened on New Year's Eve in India, in the city of Bangalore, uh, that's in the south of India, on 31st December 2016. So the news came out on the 1st of January 2017, and within 15 days, a bunch of women who did not know each other personally and still do not know, uh, a lot of them still do not know each other personally, but came together online uh, first, you know, it was it was like one person had a uh, idea that you know we need to take back the streets. She contacted somebody she knew, and just like a domino effect, everybody just contacted the feminist activists that they knew in the cities, and we all came together, made a WhatsApp group or uh, and Facebook Messenger groups, uh, chatted online, discussed how we are going to do this. This was a multi-city march. It was carried out in more than 30 cities in India at the same time on the same day. I I was responsible with my colleague who's standing next to me uh, for the Delhi protest and then there were other protests in other cities. Uh, so for us this was a really uh, big moment where we were a bunch of young women who did not know each other but came together for a common cause, used basic digital tools like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangout to discuss, organize, uh, do all logistics, get police permissions. You have to get police permissions when you are organizing a protest in India. Uh, everything was done online uh, without knowing each other and we had a successful march. It was covered widely by national and international media. So I think that would be uh, one example of how we used digital tools. I'll talk about my platform maybe yeah. later. Yeah, um, or even now, but because... Move the slides. <laughs> yes, yeah, we can do that for you. One more, please. I think, yeah. I think what I would really uh, like to know is that as I also try to start the conversation is that um, very often we only tackle a very privileged elite and I'd like to know how do you actually get the marginalized women also in an online discourse engaged. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, starting from the very basic, this is a screenshot of my website uh, feminisminindia.com and we advocate for intersectional feminism. Intersectional feminism means that we don't see women as a homogeneous category where we look at uh, oppressions via intersections. So as a uh, 
as a Muslim woman, I'm not a Muslim woman, but I'm just giving an example. As a Muslim woman, uh, you uh, are oppressed by your religion and uh, uh, your gender. The same way as a black woman, you are doubly oppressed because of the race and the gender. And that's how intersectional feminism works. It doesn't look at uh, oppression in a, in, in a one street way, but looks at the intersections, at the uh, different kind of oppressions that a woman faces. And coming to your question of marginalized women, we are a crowdsourced platform where women from all strata of the society uh, f uh, of different class, caste in India, religion, gender, sexuality write on our platform, on, on this platform to raise their voices against the issues that they feel are very important or critical to them. Uh, we use affirmative action uh, in our organization where we prioritize voices of marginalized women. Uh, and another thing that as a media platform that we have implemented and we got quite a bit of backlash for this, uh, we imp implemented a no appropriation editorial policy. That means uh, as a non-Muslim woman, I do not have the right to opinionate on should Muslim women wear a hijab or not. Uh, I do not get to speak about it because it doesn't affect me. Uh, personally at all. So let's say if we want to publish an article about should uh, hijab be mandatory or should hijab be removed like what France did, uh, you know, uh, with, we all know about the Burkini ban, uh, mm -hmm. you know, disaster that it was. Uh, that is something that we as a platform are very, very specific that only a Muslim woman can opinionate about it because it's her life and it her affects her personally as opposed to me, a non-Muslim woman or a white woman or any other woman for that matter. So this is how we uh, push marginalized voices on our platform by applying affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, when you look at, at uh, Japlene's uh, um, slides here, um, I particularly want to um, stress uh, the, the comic exactly. And it says, uh, can you read that? Yeah, I can Feminist read that. Feminist hunt, yeah. get off the internet. So uh, this was a comic that we made for a campaign on online safety. And we wanted to show how uh, online harassment affects women differently as opposed to men, especially when uh, men are advocating for feminism as opposed to when women are advocating for feminism. Mm -hmm. So both the guy and the woman in this comic are saying the same thing, which is women face a lot of online abuse. But the man is receiving compliments because he's a woke bro, he's a feminist ally. But the woman is receiving uh, abuses hurled at her because she is saying the truth. So we wanted to show the hypocrisy. This is something that happens very commonly in India mm -hmm. where uh, everywhere i'm sure where when women talk about the issues that th they face they receive abuses but when men talk about it uh they are believed much more than women mm -hmm. this must be now a question for you robert um what are your experiences with this I, I'm, I'm very glad that you bring this up because this um shows how how privilege works yes. and um this shows how much men have to bring their privilege into the discussion to use it for the for the for the good cause, so to say, or for the cause in general. Um, of course, a lot of men are still uh, afraid of speaking out about feminism and about supporting um, feminist uh, platforms. Um, but the 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 worst thing that can happen to them is usually being ridiculed online, which is something that you can stand. <laughs> and the dimension that women face are utterly different. They are threatened and they are harassed and sometimes they are being killed. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a big difference that you have always have to be aware of. Um, on the other hand, um, speaking of privileges, I think the most important thing for men is to realize that they are privileged. Not all men, haha, <laughs> to mention the hashtag, but some men are. And the question is, what do you do about your privilege? Do you use it? somehow and that's what we try to do it because if when I'm holding a, a, a talk about feminism a lot of female feminists approach me and say listen what you are saying is good but I've been saying this for like 35 years and nobody would listen to me anymore mm -hmm. and that's what I mean um, I'm using it to to get heard and by audiences that they wouldn't be heard by and this is using your privilege instead of um, just enjoying it so to say so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you bring this up. Dorothy, um, you've been an activist for, for many years and um, once online, many women suffer 
from attacks and hate speech, just as the comic uh, pointed out. And as a result, what they do is they shy away, right? So they are afraid of using these digital tools in order to promote their case, because then they also get uh, a hate speech. Um, what are your experiences in West Africa, in the West African context, and how can this withdrawal be prevented? Well, I would say that it's difficult to speak for the West African context. Mm. That's hundreds of millions of people. Um, but the bit that I do know uh, is, again, I think, uh, very standard in terms of an approach. Mm -hmm. It is working together in groups and getting the reinforcement from mm -hmm. your group and your peers that allows you to overcome this. Mm -hmm. If you're working alone, this is really difficult. Mm -hmm. But if you're part of a group of people who understand what the issues are that are connected to other uh, peer groups uh, which can support, then you do the analysis. And so when you see something like this, mm -hmm. you see that, okay, this is really quite common. Mm -hmm. And this is the profile of the kind of person who is going to write this. Mm -hmm. And you know that that person is actually basically very insecure and has uh, different psychological problems. Issues. And so you don't have to take that to heart. So I think that is it. But I think that I wanted to touch on something that Robert said, uh, because it really makes me think. We've had this movement for so long. I mean, in Africa, the Beijing conference was very much a watershed conference. Uh, that was 1995, is it? Yeah. yeah. And then we also still have the um, Sustainable Development Goal 5, mm -hmm. uh, fighting for gender equality today. So we have to figure, what did we do wrong? Why is it that we've had how many generations of boys and girls go through our educational systems and we still have these kind of problems? Mm -hmm. So it seems that we've been reluctant to address this within the educational system. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't still be, even if your parents still have these gendered roles, mm -hmm. we've been able to overcome so many other things. Mm -hmm. and, but now we still have backlash. In fact, we have even more backlash, you could say, because you're seeing it online. Mm -hmm. And we even have new forms of oppression. Uh, I really enjoyed Safia Noble's presentation mm -hmm. on the algorithms of oppression, where she was explaining how the platforms today mm -hmm. uh, have a business model that exploits stereotyping and racial bias mm -hmm. in order to make more money. So we now have new things coming up, and we still haven't addressed the old ones. Mm -hmm. Why is this? What are we doing wrong? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what are we doing wrong? I don't have a solution, of course. <laughs> I would never, ever even try to answer like this. But um, what I've learned is um, that you have to create awareness about these biases that our uh, thinking and our acting is based on. And the, the, the more I learn about this, I'm a learner, I'm not an expert, I'm not a scientist. Uh, the more I understand what this does to us and what this does to our uh, definition of masculinity, femininity, and our role in society. So uh, this is one of my approaches to teach people about the biases, not only gender-related and diversity-related, um, but, but also um, uh, business-related, just to, to show them what it does to them and to give them access to that knowledge in order to make them think. That's one approach. It's not a solution and not even close, but I absolutely share your frustration. Um, could you also show us your examples the, that, you, that you brought uh, yeah. with you? Okay, so this is, um, these are pictures from two different African countries. One is from the north of Ghana and one is from the Maasai area of Kenya. And they're using a digital device that actually has a lot of sophisticated software behind it. But it is um, a very robust audiobook type of thing. And uh, what we do is we record messages in local languages that people can replay and send feedback on. And what happens, for example, with a topic which is so common, uh, something like maternal health and how to take care of yourself during pregnancy. Because of this device, 
the man in the family would also hear the messaging mm -hmm. and understand better what his wife is going through. Whereas traditionally, he may not be allowed to discuss this issue at all as it's seen as a female issue. And then also these two ladies from Ghana are actually farmers. Mm -hmm. And we found out that using the talking book to help them with their agricultural practice mm -hmm. has increased their income Mm -hmm. And also a number of them have won prizes for being the best farmer. So the thing is, we adapt the technology to the needs of the people. Speaking to them in their own language, not putting it online, because they can't afford to be online and they are not literate. Let's see the next one. The other initiative that I wanted to hi highlight is to do with my work with the World Summit Awards where we link to the sustainable development goals and we have different kinds of projects, whether it is education, health, etc. And these are examples from around the world. Kustum from Indonesia is addressing harassment and um, being able to feel safe. Still a mum is after pregnancy, what happens? You know, how do you take care of your kid? Um, then the other one in Dolo 360 from Cameroon is also addressing maternal health and so is Omami in Nigeria. So you see that there's a lot of emphasis on the reproductive role of women. Mm -hmm. Then we have the new set, young women coming up and realizing that we have to claim the digital space. Mm -hmm. The jobs in the future are going to be for people who understand tech and too many contexts have women outside of text, uh, tech because from an early age we've done the research and we see that uh, young women are being told that it's okay, you don't have to be good at math. Math is for boys. Science is a boy's subject. And ironically you'll see in the Middle East there are more women studying technology that, as a proportion than in Germany because of this stereotyping. So Laboratoria in Chile uh, takes mature women, gives them the skills, and links them to tech jobs, mm -hmm. reorienting their career. And I love the, to uh, the title of this project, Erase All Kittens. It's a solution for teaching girls how to code, mm -hmm. and uh, young girls. So you see that, and we have um, Power to Women as part of the World Summit Awards. Um, lots and lots of encouragement to get more women in the tech space, whether it is addressing old needs, accepted issues, mm -hmm. or whether it is to address new issues, like what are we doing in terms of our participation in the digital society. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, could you also please um, give us some examples of how you can use tech to promote feminism? We've already talked about Male Feminist Europe. The platform is not the most beautiful website in the world, but it serves its purpose. Is that Mario? <laughs> and that is Mario's friend, probably. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, as you can see from the hashtag on the top, we also started a campaign there, Men for Equality, which is a growing list of men who refuse to be on all male panels and on and, 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 and all male events. So you see, we, we're still doing basic work uh, and it's, it's a policy of small steps. Um, but we do, if we don't do them, uh, we can't go any further. I um, have another uh, slide for you. I was, uh, I'm, I'm proud to be one of the four uh, German catalysts, we call, don't call them ambassadors here, we call them catalysts in English, but Botschafter in German, don't ask me why, for the He for She campaign by United Nations Women National Committee Germany. Um, the, the two guys uh, at the bottom are the organizers of Free Interrail Europe, you might have heard about this campaign, and the guy on the top uh, next to me is Gerhard, who is working with um, uh, men who are committing more or less domestic violence acts in Berlin. He's a, he's a very, very experienced guy. And I brought one example of how to put tech into uh, what we have been talking about. It, the hashtag is called Echo of Help. It's an idea by the National Committee Germany. It's not uh, an existing product, although the basis is existing. Uh, if you could show me one more. It, the idea is that why not use um, gadgets such as the Amazon Echo 
uh, to be part of a solution here. I know that the solution is coming very late because the idea behind it is um, if you have a keyword, a personal keyword, then you could use Echo as a gadget in order to inform people that you trust that something is going on. Mm -hmm. So if you want to share this, um, it, you can find a lot of this on this project. It started just two days ago, the campaign um, on, the, on the web, and maybe this comes into existence once because it's what I like about the idea is that we're using tech as a means for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And the purpose here, of course, is not prevention. It's, it's coming later. But um, to, to build it into existing platforms um, and to um, serve the actual needs there are. And maybe you want to have a, look, a closer look at that too. Yeah, it sounds amazing to me. Um, I'd like to open uh, the floor now for, for discussion. Um, I hope um, we, we gave you a lot of uh, food for thought. And um, are there any, any questions or statements? Yeah? I would like it, uh, to do it like that, that I just collect like two or three questions, and then I will uh, um, ask the panelists. Hello. Yeah, um, can, you can you introduce yourself? My yeah. name is Kwabina. I'm from Afrolink. Um, we connect startups and investors in Germany here from Africa. Um, the question is using the web as a tool to inform women about their rights or feminism. Um, let me put it in this context from Ghana. I saw on the web there's these two groups, one called pepper them, one called sugar them. Yes. Mm -hmm. There are two groups of women who are fighting over how to treat or how to serve a man or how to deal with the man. So the question is, how are you even informing the women about what it means to be a woman or what this feminist orientation is about? Because if women don't understand what feminist, feminism is about, how can they even fight for their right? Mm -hmm. You see, uh, okay, you're that's uh, right. coming to me. Um, the women who are saying, I'm, I've watched the sugar them, pepper them debate, and I think a lot of them are making comments which in English we say tongue in cheek. They're just being cheeky online to have more reaction and uh, discussion. But the point that you're making uh, is an interesting one that applies to all of us. Can I just ask, how many of you in the audience would like to be labeled as feminist? That's about half. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. that was There's amazing. a lot of <laughs> connotations that go with that label feminism. I was walking with my German friend yesterday and he said, Dorothy, you're a feminist, but you're nice. <laughs> Alex, don't you believe that men and women should have equality? He mm -hmm. said, yes. Yeah. He said, then you're a feminist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so all these people with pepper and sugar them, if you, if you ask them, do you think it's okay that somebody should be given more rights than you have? Exactly. That they, you should be able to walk freely or that it is okay for your boss to harass you, you know? They will say no. So I believe that all of us mm -hmm. are really feminists. There's hardly anybody who really believes that it's okay that uh, we should have the, that kind of discrimination. But the label feminism has distracted a lot of people from what feminism actually means. I, um, I initially planned uh, to open the session with a quote saying uh, feminism is the radical notion that women are actually people which really goes in the same direction uh, what you said it was uh, i think by shira uh, mary shira uh, 1986 the quote already um yeah you please yeah feel, feel free comment on this on how can we um, unite yeah. <laughs> sugar them pepper them means give them help okay. and sugar them is I'll ah, okay. Okay. I will comment on uh, the question and also when you ask the audience. So, uh, uh, this is this is not uncommon to see that people hesitate from uh, calling themselves feminists or associating with the term. It has a lot of baggage, and uh, I would disagree a bit here. Uh, 
to say that feminism just means uh, gender equality or that men and women should have equal rights. Mm. I think that's a very simplified uh, uh, definition of feminism. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does. Uh, I, I, for me, feminism is much more than that. It's a, it's quite a political statement, mm -hmm. uh, and I understand. I mean, uh, I understand why people, uh, or you know, people who do not want to call themselves feminists, or why they dissociate. But for me, it's a very personal and political statement because I am standing on a lot of issues uh, which are political in nature, and as we know, the personal is political. Sure. So it is, it is a very mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's a statement that you make. Uh, you have to be very conscious of you know. Yeah, yeah. You have to. You you are very conscious of the kind of statement that you are making. Uh, the kind of uh, power that comes with the statement, uh, with the term, when you say you are a feminist. Uh, but yeah, making it very simple is that men and women must have equal rights. Next question, please. Uh, hi, Ulrike from Germany. That actually ties in very well with the question I had because, uh, Robert, you said earlier that uh, men often have a problem with the term feminism. So I was wondering, because there's a big discussion online, um, that maybe if we call it uh, humanism, uh, more people would get on board. And so I would like to ask you, what do you think about it? Should we name it something else so that people are more comfortable with it? Or oh, men are more comfortable with it. Yeah, men, but also, <laughs> yeah. I think there are also women that say, yeah. oh, it's yeah. not just about us. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in all of your opinions. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm, I think um, that language and, and framing and, and stuff like that is very important. On the other hand, I don't think we have to change the term feminism. Uh, it, it's, it's better for people to think about what it has in store for them, to think about the concepts that are behind them. There, it's not only one concept, there are, there are so many concepts that I, I was always afraid of getting into the debate because I thought I need to know every single bit of it before being able to say something. Uh, I've got quite a problem with humanism because humanism would mean that we already achieved gender equality and not discriminating against one of and, on, and, and, and several others of the genders there are. Um, uh, I think uh, the concept or the ideology itself is offering so much that it goes far beyond, as you said, I'm glad you said that it's far beyond uh, talking about gender equality only. Um, and if you start uh, thinking about what gives you orientation in, in your life as a member of society, as a political person, then I think feminism is one of the best concepts out there um, to draw ideas and to draw orientation from it. And I think r rather than changing the name is spreading the, the news that this is the case. Yeah, maybe also, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, next question. Yes, hello, my name is Susanne Fuchs. I'm working for Deutsche Welle Akademie with a project called Women at Web, mm -hmm. addressing um, the backlashes um, women in East Africa face online concerning online violence. And um, this is uh, concerning especially very outspoken women who are engaging in controversial discussions and are very loud. And then this is the phenomenon you described earlier. It happens that they are withdrawing because of online hatred, violence. So I was, I don't know really who to, maybe to all three of you, also Robert maybe, I was wondering, okay, you can um, invest in training and digital safety, um, but uh, is there any strategy you know of, or strategies, how women can face or react to online violence immediately? Is there anything that you could think of. I mean, or what you were mentioning, you're working with a colleague from Denmark. I know there is the Swedish campaign called Here I Am. I'm thinking about um, more like hands-on, really immediate strategies and reaction to online violence against women, not only in East Africa, but maybe globally. Thank you. Okay, who wants to take the question? Yeah, Jeplin. Thank you. Uh, in India, there's also a lot of online violence, and uh, at my organization, we specifically work on this topic. 
uh, we have found out that uh, more than 70% uh, of the women, especially women who are outspoken activists, journalists, face online violence. I think uh, beyond you know reporting it to the social media platform or blocking uh, or uh, you know censoring your own account for some time just so that the trolls die down, the biggest support comes from within the community. It's very important because online harassment or online violence also affects you uh, affects you and your mental health. It affects you psychologically. So although it's not violence per se that it's not physical violence nobody is hurting you physically nobody's coming out of the screen and you know hurting you physically but it really affects you so it's important to have emotional support and it's important to have that that community which offers you emotional support but also counters back to the uh, trolls or to the abuse. So what we do uh, in India or in my group is when we see a person uh, being harassed, we will jump on to that harassment. So that means that if uh, she was targeted, yeah, it's like if the trolls were only targeting her, the target will be divided. So although we are making other women also vulnerable, but it's dividing the hate as opposed to just one person taking it. So it's more of a community thing and it really works for us both both in terms of combating the online violence and in terms of emotional support. Can I mention mm -hmm. something? Yeah. I think that one of the things that they do very well in India is they also use the tech skills <laughs> because people are hiding mm -hmm. behind uh, pseudonyms and alibis online. And with tech skills, you can trace exactly where this is coming from and be able to um, find out uh, through links to other parts of the net that they are visible on, who is actually doing this? And then you call their name, mm -hmm. and then yeah. that frightens them. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, naming mm -hmm. and shaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert, yeah? If I may, I would like to Just add a quick one another, another claim. We have to reclaim the digital space. Yeah. We means that people who are supporting the ideas that we are talking about, name it feminism or whatever you want to name it, um, you have to be visible. You cannot just say that I don't want to go online and I don't want to discuss online because it's such a bad world out there. Because that means we're leaving the world to the, to the bad guys, basically. Mm -hmm. So be visible, um, make yourself heard and show that the digital space is nothing that will be left to them. Yeah, I, I like to applaud to this. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, we have time, I think, for, for two more questions. Hi. and. Just one moment, who are Here. you, where are you? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Abir, I'm from Lebanon, and this panel made me feel very, very uneasy because um, there's a lot of, I don't know, white feminism, and there's, um, like you were talking, um, the man on the panel, about um, make, making about your privilege and giving visible voices for women. I mean, feminism is very, very visible and very, very loud. And if you're wondering about the privilege, you can just step aside and give more voices for women. That's one. And then, like, in your website you said men should support feminism. Well, either be a feminist or, I don't know, that's, that's something. And white feminism in the sense like we cannot talk about a feminist internet without talking about intersectionality, about people of color, about queer people. And it's, there's this divide. It's not only digital. I mean, online is a replication of what, of what we face offline. Gender-based violence, harassment, all of that. And feminism, I mean, again, like, it's not women's job to educate, right? Feminism is not when you talk about not all men. We're trying to, we don't want to divert the conver uh, conversation from the methods of patriarchy that oppress women to the optics of men. When we say patriarchy, it's not men. So I think we should really reconsider how we talk about the web women want, right? Mm -hmm. Because I did not feel it here in this panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would, you. would you like to comment on that, uh, uh, Dorothy? I think that... Um, well, I, I must say that I think the panel is a little bit diverse, but all your points are very valid. Um, we have to make sure that we understand the different dimensions of oppression. Mm -hmm. And um, when we discuss feminism, uh, people often accuse white feminists of um, wanting to fix things for themselves within an existing system. 
Whereas as a black feminist and um, even as an African feminist, we face different kinds of oppression. Mm -hmm. And so our agenda is going to be, of course, different. But I think that the main thing that you said that's really important is um, that we are not supposed to support, we are supposed to become feminists. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think anything can top that. I think that is one key message that we have to leave this place with. But how do we get the web we want, the feminist web we want? It means that you've got to have feminist world. a feminist world, which we don't have now. I, I see that time is coming up and there's mm -hmm. two more hands, so let me let the other questions come and then when we round Yeah, okay. Okay, last question, please. And then I would uh, like to wrap up. Rebecca? No? Ah, Beata. Yes. Uh, there is a mic, I think, somewhere coming here. Yes. So, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. I'm All right. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Call feminism equalism was the was the hint here. Um, I think we don't have time for uh, uh, one more. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Tanya. Um, I just have a question um, related on what if you say feminism is equality of the sexes, um, and I mean, whilst I also believe that in most areas women um, face inequalities. I mean, there are also some areas in which um, boys face inequalities, and I think especially in the educational system in some Western countries where women for a long time have outperformed, or girls have outperformed boys. And I was wondering if you really um, say feminism is about equality of the sexes, is it also the role of feminism to support inequalities that go the other way? Mm -hmm. Jen, Dorothy, Robert? No? Okay, Dorothy goes. I'm the victim here. I think, I think that um, when we're saying equality for the sexes, we're not saying that men and women are the same. Mm -hmm. This is one of the confusions that we always have, that it means that a female athlete should be able to run as fast as a male athlete or whatever. We're talking about power, actually. And um, I'm glad that my colleague mentioned that Essentially, feminism is political. We're talking about who is in control, who has the power right now, and how can we redistribute that power. Um, the problems of the educational system for boys and girls uh, is, for me, part of that more systemic approach that we need to take. Basically, now that we have the digital influence on our society. We need to be rethinking how we organize our societies better. We know that boys develop uh, skills slower than girls in early childhood. How does the school system handle that? Mm -hmm. We know that girls have a problem with maths for a brief time in early adolescence. How does the school system handle that? So these are systemic issues in terms of how we organize our society. I'm going to use it to round up yeah. and just say that, look, things have changed, but we are still operating these same old patriarchal systems where the power is in the hands of a few. And unfortunately, they have different gonads than I do. But then there's a lot of opportunities to use the tech space, but the tech space is also creating new problems. And I just want to plug this project from South Sudan, which is called Hashtag Defy Hate Now. I never knew that the South Sudanese conflict had been fueled by social media mm -hmm. and by people sitting in the diaspora, mainly men, mm -hmm. uh, to create and accentuate that conflict. And who is suffering? It's women. So it's, for me, a perfect example mm -hmm. of how power and control affect women's lives. We want to reverse that. We want to take it back. We want people to be aware of how it works so that they can overturn it. Take the power back. Mm. Okay.
Unfortunately, we ran out of time. I can still see there are a lot of questions. I'd just like to invite you to come to our stand. Uh, the panelists also will be there present to continue this dialogue. There is another session um, that we organize. Uh, it's called No Woman, No Web later on, I think also with the Sudanese ex uh, examples in there. Let me just quickly point to the most important points, I think, in our discussion. In the very beginning, you said tech is changing the way we play the game. To use tech as a facilitator to actually reclaim the digital sphere. Um, we, have, we have had examples on how to get men on board. I think the echo of help is a very interesting uh, thing that we could um, have a closer look on. Also, we pointed out that education seems to be key, and all, not only education addressing coding for girls, but also addressing uh, uh, boys. Um, we have uh, heard a lot of examples. Also, thank you to the Deutsche Welle Academy. Um, Women on Web was the, the example. Maybe you can also be at the stand so we can all learn a bit more about it. Um, and I think what... Um, what is also really key is the comment from uh, um, from the audience, uh, from the from the lady from uh, Lebanon, I think it was, who said like, um, "Don't support feminists, just be a feminist." I really like that one. And um, yeah, I think let's close with this remark: be a feminist, be more visible, use tech in order to reclaim the digital sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shun.